Hello, everyone. Um, David, this time we talk about liquidators' recoveries. That's right, Francis. So today we're going to look at unfair preferences, transactions at undervalue, extortionate credit transactions, floating charges, fraudulent trading, conveyances, and other misfeasance. Welcome to this YouTube channel of KLeaders. I'm Francis Chen. I'm David Wong. David, please share with us your topic. Thank you, Francis. So today we're talking about liquidators' recoveries. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of actions that a liquidator can take to challenge certain types of transactions which occurred prior to the commencement of the winding up. The first uh, is unfair preferences. And this is where a company has paid a creditor uh, before other creditors, mm. driven by a desire to prefer that particular creditor. Mm. The key thing is that the company was insolvent at the time of that payment or becomes insolvent as a result of it. And there are different clawback periods, which is the period of time that the transaction must have taken place prior to the commencement of the winding up. Mm. Uh, in particular, if the transaction is with a connected person, that's someone associated with the company, it's presumed to be an unfair preference. I see. David, I want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. If my client unfortunately go insolvent, but they pay my bill before the insolvency or the commencement liquidation, would the liquidator ask me to repay my fees? So certainly that's something that could occur if the company uh, was driven by a desire to unfairly prefer you over other creditors at that time. So the liquidator has to prove uh, the unde undesired preference, right? That's right. They have to prove that the intent was to uh, pay you in priority to other creditors. Okay, thank you. So the next type of transaction that is commonly looked at is what we call transactions at undervalue. So this is where the insolvent company might have gifted some assets or entered into a transaction that has very little benefit to itself. Mm -hmm. And this might include providing security for someone else's uh, loans. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, the company must have been insolvent at the time or become insolvent as a result of the transaction. And the period for this uh, is five years prior to the commencement of the winding up. That means if the transaction happened within that five-year period, a liquidator may challenge it. I see. Another liquidator's recovery uh, is extortion credit transactions. So if the company has entered into a loan agreement where the there are exorbitant kind of interest rates mm. or fees, mm -hmm. um, then a liquidator may also challenge and unwind that transaction. Okay. And the period for that is three years prior to the date of the winding up order. I understand. Another common liquidator's uh, investigation will be looking at the floating charges. And those created within the clawback period will be void as against the liquidator. Um, except to the extent that any new money was advanced for that new floating charge. Mm. And again, there's a requirement that the company was insolvent at the time or becomes insolvent as a consequence of the granting of that floating charge. Mm. Again, we have a slightly different uh, clawback period. So it's mm. 12 months prior to the commencement of the liquidation if it's an unconnected party, but two years if the floating charge was granted to a connected person. I see. And finally, we also uh, have fraudulent trading, mm. fraudulent conveyances, misfeasance, which are all types of liquidators recoveries as well. And the clawback period for those, however, uh, and that, the, that is the period in which the liquidator can tra challenge the transaction, mm. it's a little bit trickier because uh, it depends on the limitations ordinance and it varies depending on the type of action mm. uh, listed there. David, I want to ask, because I hear the, uh, the, the, the term wrongful trading, is it equivalent to fraudulent trading? So fraudulent trading is driven by dishonesty, mm. and it's actually quite a high threshold. Mm. Wrongful trading or insolvent trading is not the same as fraudulent mm. trading. Um, and Hong Kong doesn't have any wrongful trading laws yet, but they are in the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, I... I mentioned uh, earlier that if the company do not have the funding uh, for the liquidator to do all these investigations, is the liquidator still obliged to do these investigations? Yes, yeah, so the liquidator is obliged to look into these matters. 
Um, and indeed, if there are viable claims, uh, mm. such as to pursue, uh, you know, transactions that undervalue or unfair preferences or fraudulent trading, um, liquidators can actually get what's called liquidation funding to pursue those claims against the the relevant parties. I see. So um, during the investigation, if the liquidator find out any um, fraudulent transactions which lead reporting to the authorities like ICAC or CCB, I think the liquidator still have the obligation to report, right? That's right. So the liquidator will make those reports. Okay, sorry. One last question <laughs> for me on this slide uh, is regarding the recoveries. Hmm. So once the liquidator get the recoveries uh, from whatever party uh, out of these kind of proceedings, what the liquidator would do with those recoveries? So if the liquidator makes the recovery under any of these actions, mm -hmm. um, the benefit of it, the, the money that they get back, will go to the benefit of the creditors as a whole. So that's why these are called liquidator's recoveries, mm -hmm. uh, because only the liquidator can make them. But the benefit of it goes to the estate, so it goes to pay the creditor's claims. So thank you very much for sharing, David. Um, there's a lot to cover in this episode. Uh, can you summarize uh, what's the key point for this episode? Yeah, there is a lot in this episode, and it's particularly technical. And, and mm. uh, I think the key thing to remember for uh, counterparties, be they directors, creditors, or others, is that they must exercise care when dealing with companies in financial stress. Mm. So even though they're not in a liquidation process, if they are in financial stress, mm. then care must be taken in terms of the transactions that you enter into them. Otherwise, there is a possibility uh, they could be attacked later if the company goes into winding up. I see. Thank you very much. David, actually, this is the last of your presentation with us uh, in the insolvency series. <laughs> so, There's so much to talk about. <laughs> yes, maybe next time we can invite you all to talk about another topics. So thank you very much for all your contribution to the videos. Thank you, Francis. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Yeah, so next time we'll have another uh, presenter to share with us another topic. So stay with us and see you next time. Bye bye. bye. Thank you for watching this video. If you like it, please give us a like and subscribe and share with your friends. Look forward to your continued support. See you next time. Bye bye.